Hey, good Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. I am Eric Kane alongside Brent Hubs. Awesome price. Big thanks, as always, to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, for making this coverage possible. Local, trusted since 1999. Give them a call, 865-524-5888, or visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. we got a lot of questions to get into, but first, obviously, down here on location in Orlando, Florida, Citrus Bowl coming up here in the next few days. Big news on a Wednesday afternoon, Austin Price. Uh, we broke the, the news first here at VolQuest.com, but Tennessee changing quarterbacks. Joe Milton opts out. Nico Iamaliava is going to be the starter, his first of many starts in a Tennessee uniform. Yeah, I mean, a lot of excitement now as we head into Monday's, uh, you know, uh, Citrus Bowl. And this is in the, a, a time of year where you see this more and more. You see the younger guys playing um, because of opt-outs, because of guys turning pro. and you know, you're seeing that, you know, with Kansas State's quarterback. You're seeing that, you know, with, with you know, Arnold at Oklahoma. Now you're seeing that with Nico. And so there's a lot of excitement. And I think there's a lot of excitement within the program. Not the, no, That's not to, you know, say that, you know, they didn't appreciate Joe because I think they appreciate everything Joe did. But I think that uh, they were kind of excited to kind of get an early glimpse at next year Hubber um, with number eight back there against a really good Iowa defense. So, again, we talked about this on, on Wednesday – We'll probably talk a lot about it between now and Monday, and even after Monday. The instant reactions to Nico, good or bad, probably you know is going to be you know kind of all over the map. But it's probably just you know par for the course at this point. Absolutely, it's par for the course, and that's what you deal with in in college athletics. And it is exciting. Uh, and that's not a that's not a knock on Joe. That's not a knock on the seniors. But everybody is eyes ahead, right? You're you're looking for what's down the road and. You, you, you got the countdown clock on. How many days is it till football time starts back once this game is over? And, you know, you want to do so with as much enthusiasm as you can have. And obviously a year ago, Joe Milton created a ton of enthusiasm. And, and we'll see what Nico c- can get done in, in this game here. I, I'll say this, too. I don't think the story was going to hold uh, Austin. But but I will I will give Josh Heupel credit. I think it was a smart PR move on his part just to come out, not, not try to play the gamesmanship all week long. I mean – you know, who's going to warm up? What are you going to do? I mean, for Joe's sake and his narrative, I think putting some closure to it early in the week and let some of the, uh, it, you know, lots of national people are going to talk about Nico all week long, right? So when when you see halftime and they're previewing the cheese at Citrus Bowl, it, the previews now is going to be about Tennessee and it's going to be about Nico. And I think all those PR things are solid for Tennessee as you head into the offseason. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at, you know, just the instant reaction, you know, that, that we, you know, we all got, you know, um, you know, on, on, you know, Wednesday, like, I think that you immediately started getting texts. I mean, you know, I've got, you know, multiple people have texted me Wednesday, people that, you know, knew that this was going to happen, text me and said, you know, Hey man, I'm going to be in this part of Florida, Vero beach, Florida with the fam. I think I'm going to drive over now and, and watch the game. They weren't planning to do so. And now they are because, of who is starting a quarterback. So I think the more, you know, you're going to see that happen, some trickle, you know, trickle down. I'm not saying that there's going to be 15,000 extra ball fans, but I think you're going to have a trickle down of fans that go, you know, man, spontaneously, let's go to Orlando and watch Nico's first game as a starter. And, uh, you know, I think that you'll have some of that. And so uh, I just think there's a lot more excitement. I, you know, you talked to Andy Staples on, on Wednesday afternoon. What was he saying? He was saying, Man, I'm excited to watch that game now. Like, I just don't know if there was a whole lot of excitement to yeah. watch, you know, Joe Milton in his last game. No offense to Joe, but, I mean, he was, a, right. a, you know, a lame duck quarterback from a standpoint of he didn't have any more games to play against an Iowa defense and an Iowa offense that oh, is pretty painful to watch at times. They win games, but but it's still not a very pretty product to watch. And so now well, it's a bit of intrigue. Like, oh, what about this Nico guy? Well, good, bad, or indifferent. It changes the narrative. Well, and, and Eric, I think when you look at this, I mean, fans love, A, the backup quarterback, and two, they love the shiny new toy, right? And and this is the shi- this is the shiny new toy, Eric. I mean, right? This is the guy that, you know, when, when you mention, you, you start talking about Tennessee, okay, Joe's doing, the, even when Joe's playing well, there's talk about, okay, well, how's Nico's progression, right? I mean, this is the guy, I mean, he's the former 
number one player in the country, according to on three from a year ago, everybody wants to see this guy. He is the, it's the shiny new toy. I mean, it's Christmas, right? You got the new toy and you want to play with it. And that's what Tennessee fans are going to get to see. And I think they're excited about that, Eric. Well, and, and Eric, I'll tell you who's excited is Charles Power because Charles is the only one that had the guts to put Nico as the number one player in the country. Everybody else no. stuck with Arch because that was the safe thing to do, right? He had the guts to say, you know what? I think Nico is is, is better. And, and he went with that. And, you know, I, I, he'll be excited. I know that he's going to be excited and it could be validated. I'm not saying one game validates, but like just if, if Nico plays well enough to kind of show a glimpse heading into next year, you know, that's more than a lot of these freshmen have been able to do this year. Dante Moore's already left. You know, you, you saw the same thing with Malachi Nelson. Arch Manning has not played at Texas outside of one game. Um, this is a real opportunity here. Um, and, and, and for really for Avery at Kansas State, for Arnold at Oklahoma, and now Nico to get a jump start on 2024. Yeah, Brent, I want to get your thoughts on that here in just a moment. But first, I, I, from a – it is 100% reinvented this bowl game, right? I mean, you had Tennessee fans who were like, oh, eight and four is what it is. Basketball season, let's go on to 2024. It's Nico. Well, 2024 is here. Your entire secondary, minus two players, you know, are, are young guys. You got some patchwork on the offensive line that's going to be returning next year, and that's great to see. You have these young linebackers, of course, but Nico's here. Nico's going to play quarterback. So not only for Tennessee fans who are going to be really excited now to kind of watch this game and see how this season now completely ends. But college football fans are going to be tuning in like Andy Staples are going to be tuning in because there's some intrigue here. And so that, that's enough to get all of us excited. Plus, you know, we're getting to cover it. So it's a heck of a story and we're excited about it. But also when you look at how Tennessee handled it from a PR perspective, you mentioned it a moment ago, Brent, kind of how Josh Heupel spoke about Joe Milton, you know, how Nico is, is, is likely going to speak about Joe Milton here in the next couple hours um, kind of passing the torch, if you will. It looks really good from a PR standpoint that that Joe's still there. He's still coaching. He's opting out, but he's still kind of giving his all for Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? At least that's what they're trying to perceive. So it looks good on all accounts. There's a ton of interest now in this bowl game, and there's a lot to be excited about. Now, Brent Austin kind of hit on it there, but I want to ask you, you can't take everything from one football game. But what will this tell you looking ahead to 2024 if Nico balls out or if Nico struggles? Well, I, I think it just tells you where he's at in the start of his journey. And, and I think as, as a spectator, we're not going to know every play call. We're not going to know every mistake that he made. Did, did he make a bust here? Did he do something there? You know, we're, we're not going to know all of that. You see a miscommunication. Who is that on? All those things we don't know. But it, it, it is a – it's kind of the the, the base layer uh, of where he is and where he's going to develop and go from there. I, I think that Austin mentioned the hot takes, and, and there'll be plenty of those. But at the same time, too, Austin, I wonder if those takes are a little bit um, minimized, if there's a little bit more of an even kill take on it, because everybody took a lot from what Joe Milton did in the Clemson game a year ago and kind of ran with that. And, and that one game – I don't think he played as well in that game as a lot of other people perceived him to. I don't think he played poorly. He made three or four big-time wild throws. But I think a lot of people ran with a handful of plays in that, that that Joe maybe was in a place that that Joe just what wasn't at. And not that Joe played poorly this year, but the idea that he was just immediately going to step in and it was going to be just like Hendon Hooker was a real false narrative that I think that bowl game created. So I think there'll be some people that go – yeah, we need to see more, but I want to see it. And you do get the opportunity to see it on Monday, which is the biggest thing. Yeah, I mean, that, that's right. I mean, when you look at, you know, you had, I thought you had the nail on the head from a standpoint of like, you don't know the offense. Like, Nico may make a play and you go, oh my God, what a play by Nico. And he may have totally made the wrong read and it just worked out in his favor. That happens all the time that fans or, or media like us, that, you know, the coach goes, well, he's actually supposed to do here and that worked out, but I mean, it wasn't supposed to be drawn up that way. Or he may make a play and you go, God, that was terrible. And in reality, it was because the receiver ran the wrong route, you know, and, and, and Nico threw it where it was supposed to be. So, I mean, like, you know, I, I think you just have to kind of let it play out. I, again, a lot more excitement, a lot more intrigue. And um, there are plenty of teammates that are excited for this move to Nico. I've talked to several of them and they're, they're probably not, it's again, not, not to say they didn't love Joe. They did, but I think that, 
that you know now they're here at the end of the season like one more game with joe was just be one more game with joe this is a step towards the future we're in orlando which means there's a great big beautiful tomorrow baby just like disney world's carousel of progress so like you know that you keep the disney theme rolling this week you know and and tomorrow and then the monday that'll be a uh a storyline that will all be buzzing i was gonna say there's 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 a lot of magic in the air. Is, is that right, AP? Always around Orlando. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead too. and. <laughs> There's a lot of traffic, too. There's a lot of traffic in yeah. Georgia. <laughs> a lot of traffic in, in, in Georgia coming off uh, the Christmas holiday, but. Anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of excitement here. We got all the coverage, everything. We had tons and tons of content on the site yesterday. Joe Milton opting out. Nico Imaliava stepping in. What's this mean for Tennessee? You know, what's the defense look like that Nico's going to face? All that type of stuff. We have coverage from yesterday, today, and leading you up into the Citrus Bowl. All that and more. That's at VolQuest.com. Uh, before we get into uh, some of our questions for the mailbag edition of the show, let's go ahead and give a quick thank you and give a, get a quick word from our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. It's one of those phone calls that you hate to get from your kids. Hey dad, a tree fell on my house. Well, we got that call a couple of weeks back from our daughter at her house here. And the first call that I made was to Exterior Home Solutions. The peace of mind that they gave me and us as a family when they came out here and came up with a plan, got us connected with the right people is absolutely priceless. Use the same people that I use. In that time of need, Exterior Home Solutions. Again, that phone number is 865-524-5888. You can give them a call for a free estimate. That is ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. Big thanks to our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get into your mailbag questions here. And we'll go ahead and we'll start with Athrun, if I can find them. Atheron, all right, so with the new NCAA transfer rule, how many more names do you think are going to enter the portal? We'll start with that one. He's got a couple more first, but it's new, Austin. Uh, you know, chances of, of guys who have already transferred once who would have been forced to stay at a school, they can now go and enter the transfer portal again. Do you think there'll be any of those cases here at Tennessee? Well, I mean, I think there's an opportunity, right? I mean, you, you think about, like, you know, Gerald Mincy, you think about Dante Thornton. You know, uh, you know, John Campbell could. I mean, I don't think John Campbell or Gerald Mincy will, but I think it, it, these are, the, again, names you have to pay attention to because they're starters. And they, two weeks ago, were locked in because, you know, they couldn't really go anywhere else. Now there's an opportunity where if, you know, they don't feel like they're getting enough in NIL, do they test the waters, kind of see what's out there? Um, does some team start tampering? Uh, again, things all have to be, you, you have to watch all this stuff, right? And, um, that's not me hinting at anybody. I'm just saying that, you know, you look at the ones that we're talking about, you know, Omar Norman Lott, Andre Keurig, those are all guys that have transferred in here that in theory could transfer again without having to graduate. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, again, they'll have to do so within a four day window after the bowl game. So you're looking at next Friday at Tennessee, you know, if none of those kids are in the portal by next Friday, they'll be locked in. All right, will Tennessee take a flyer on a high school tight end for the late signing period or try to find a transfer with three years of eligibility left? Tennessee, of course, got the high school commitment of Cole Harrison. Holden stays coming in via the transfer portal. Any more addition for the tight end room in February or the second transfer portal window? As of now, no. Yeah, yeah I'm just saying I'm with Austin. I mean, I think as of now, no. Now, again, here's what you don't know. I mean, once we get to Friday and, and that period closes, um, th then that's going to lock anybody from the SEC going from an SEC to an SEC school. But you never know what happens in the late signing period um, or, or the late transfer. What are you shaking your head at, AP? You, not, not necessarily. Alabama would be the one team because they can enter that portal for four days right. post whenever they're right. eliminated. If, okay. if they make it to the championship game, I'm, I'm just saying that those dates okay. for them could fluctuate. I was just right. Gonna... Yeah. Okay. yeah, you're exactly right. I, I mean, that's a good technicality to point out on because I don't. Know. My, my my point I was trying to make is if you don't go into this winter window, and that's the phrase I should have said, not the Friday date, the winter window, then you can't go SEC to SEC. Now the question is, does somebody go into the portal outside of the SEC in the spring window, in the small spring window? following a spring practice that could get somebody's attention. 
maybe. I, I don't I don't see a flyer on a high school kid. I, I just don't. I, I think Tennessee exhausted the high school kid ranks in, in the last three weeks going into the early signing period. I don't think there was anybody out there who didn't sign. So I, I just have a hard time seeing them with, with a high school with, with a high school kid in the late signing period. I, I don't I don't know if you find one in January or you, you uncover a diamond in the rough in January is what I'm saying. Yeah, the ones you take a flyer on late just never pan out. I mean, like even if it's a transfer, like taking a transfer post April is is never a good thing. Tennessee's done that a handful of times since Heibel's been here, and none of those kids have ever factored, ever played, or anything. Um, you know, I I just think that you're more than likely what you want. I think Hubbard is is Alec Abram to take some of the lessons he learned in year one because there was always going to be lessons to learn. The guy had never been on the field as a recruiter, had never been on the road, and and so. You hope that he's better for some of those lessons he learned in year two. And I think that's kind of where you start to maybe see some growth uh, from recruiting that position. All right. Any clue on the secondary starters for the bowl game? I think those starters at cornerback will be Gabe Judy Lawley, Ricky Gibson. I do think Christian Conyer um, and, and, um, and Jordan Matthews will see some playing time. At star, it's going to be Jordan Thomas. The safeties are going to be Jalen McCullough, Andre Turrentine. John Slaughter should see some action at safety, and Willie Brooks would be the backup at star and, and at safety as well. And then one more from Athron. Um, what is the plan at kicker for next season? Austin, you mentioned it earlier. Um, transfers or somebody on a roster that can win the job. You've got Turbeville. you got JT Carver. What do you think Tennessee does at place kicker? Yeah, I think it'll either be Turbeville, uh, Carver, or Max Carroll, the, uh, um, the young man from Los Angeles. Um, and one of those three um, you know, the, the, will have the inside track. And so uh, they'll have an open competition in the spring. And I would be shocked, you know, yeah, and, and we talked about this coming down the road. And Hub said, you know, I don't see that happening. And, 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 and he just has dominated the kickoffs. I just don't see them going away from Turbeville on kickoffs. He's just so good with that leg. You know, I just don't see it. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have somebody ready because the last thing you want is your place kicker to get a sore leg, you know, that, that it affects place kicks. Um, but but to, to take that place kicking job, somebody's going to have to be consistently, Eric, putting it in the end zone. And uh, I just don't know if they've got anybody on the roster who can do what Turbeville can do. The good news is with Turbeville, it looks pretty effortless on the kickoff. So you hope that that doesn't exhaust his leg to where it affects him as a place kicker, Eric. All right, let's go to SC Vol 247. Uh, what's up with William Martinez's contract? Has the deal been finalized but not announced? What percent chance do you think that he's coaching at Tennessee in April? Brand, it feels like William Martinez is going to be a part of this coaching staff uh, for 2024, right? Yeah, barring a change, I think there's a 100% chance that he's coaching this team and, and coaching the secondary in April. In terms of an announcement on something, here's what we've learned, Austin, from Danny White. They're in no hurry to announce anything. Um, I mean, it just it seemingly takes forever to get any kind of announcement made on a contract extension or anything signed. Um, and, in fact, I mean, I, I think that delay was a part of the reason why Brian Penske left as the Lady Vols soccer coach and went to Florida State. That's a story for a different day. Not that anybody's diving into that one, but I, I think it just takes a while, whatever. It's general counsel. It's there was a period that, that, that Danny White wanted to announce everything at one time in the, in the spring or summer and. You know, we'll see. I, I do. I do feel like Willie Martinez is going to be back at Tennessee as Tennessee's corners coach next year, unless Coach Martinez decides for some reason he doesn't want to continue coaching. AP, that's where I'm at with that one. Yeah, one million percent, he's back. And that's where AP is with that one as well. Let's go to Sam Smith, twenty-two thirty-three. In your expert opinion, why is the excitement for this bowl game so low? Is it just how boring Iowa is now? Keep in mind, he wrote this question before the news about Nico. Now, AP, I think it completely changes. Now, there is so much entry, like we spoke on earlier, not just from the Tennessee fan base, but really from around college football because Nico is going to be playing quarterback in this one. Yeah, I mean, the, the excitement level is, is definitely on an uptick, right? Um, but I get what he's saying. Like, and it is simply because Iowa plays such a boring brand of football. They are defense, defense, and more defense, and if – you know, if they could win, if Ferentz could win every game three to two, he would be very happy doing that. Like, you know, Josh Hype was not built that way, right? Like, I mean, a win's a win, but he did not, not built to play games like that. 
So it's kind of contrasting styles. It's the immovable force meets the unstoppable object or whatever it's called. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's just one of those things where Iowa plays a certain brand of basketball or, or football and, you know, they're not going to change. They're going to be who they are, however, and, you know, it, you know they'll go drag Tennessee down into the mud and see if they can win a low-scoring just rock fight. Yeah, and, and Eric, I think the big question in college football is just how do you make bowl games exciting? And, and I think we're seeing it. I mean, I think that – I think two, Andy Staples has mentioned this. I mean, two of the more exciting bowl games are guys who are playing freshman quarterbacks to see. Because outside of being in a playoff, I just don't know that a lot of people deem deem the value of a bowl game aside from getting to see the future uh, of your team. I, I mean, I, I just think that that's uh, unfortunate, but but I think that's kind of where bowl games are going. I mean, I don't think there's a ton of buzz about New Year's Six Bowls, you know? I mean, and, and I don't think it's necessarily all because they're bad matchups or, or – are boring matchups. I just think bowl games are in a real challenge right now. And I think that's only going to continue, Eric, with the expansion of the playoffs. Everybody is excited for, for Nico. I'm excited for Cam Sell. Like to see him get, you know, 15 carries against a good defense with the with the starting offensive line in front of him, or most of them anyway. Like I, I'm excited for that as much as I am, you know, to see what Nico can do. Yeah, there, there's a question about the running backs here in a moment, but uh, to your point, Brent, for, for sure, I mean, with the playoff ex expanding from 4 to 12, I mean, it's just going to make these bowl games feel even more obsolete. I, I just think that, like, if you're if you're a fan base like where Tennessee is right now and you're looking to the future for sure, secondary, some parts on offense, you know, young linebackers, and, of course, your quarterback, then it's super exciting to watch this bowl game now. But if you're a team where – you've been decimated by the transfer portal or guys opting out for the NFL draft or, you know, decimated by the transfer portal because you're coaching, because you have a coaching change and you limp into this bowl game with 55 scholarship players, you know, one scholarship quarterback, you know, whatever the case may be. Florida State. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, that's tough. And, and so I get it. Um, it it's just kind of like you're seeing where football is right now. These bowl games are kind of affected one of those two ways, whether there is some excitement because of those opt outs or, Man, like, what are we even doing here? Somebody's going to get hurt. There's not enough players to play. But it's only going to get worse with the with the 12 team playoff. Uh, kind of on that note, let's go to Rutland for Life. He wants to know what the game plan is for running backs in the bowl game. Had a three headed monster this past year. It's going to be a lot of Samson, seldom with a little bit of Keith question mark. Um, AP, it's going to be a whole lot of uh, of, uh, of of Cam Seldon, of course, but also Dylan Sampson. Feels like that's going to be the one two option with Samson being the one. Yeah, I think you'll see. Uh... Dylan Sampson get a ton of carries in this game. And I think when he's out, it'll be Cam Seldon. And then maybe, maybe an outside shot of Cleveland. But I think it's basically those two. Well, and I'm going to be fascinated to see, too, how much do they run Nico? What what do they do with the quarterback run game? I mean, Gaston Moore is the backup. But what do they do there? How, willingness, how willing are they to run Nico? A year ago in the bowl game, they ran Joe a lot against Clemson. Um, what, where, where is Tennessee from the standpoint of – how, are, how effective are they going to use the quarterback's legs other than the scramble thing? I think that's another storyline within the game uh, to watch, Eric. Yeah, for sure. And again, when, when you have you know, questions about numbers in your quarterback room, this is the last game of the year, of course, but you're right. I mean, Gaston Moore is the backup, but they did run Joe a lot in that ball game. And at points of times in the 23 season, you know, Joe ran a lot as well. And so that was good to see. Um, Rotely for Life has one more question. This is a question for you, Brent. If you're Danny White, what are your top three priorities for 2024? I guess kind of kind of make it your own there. Well, I mean, I think from a facility standpoint, your biggest priority is you got to stand on the head of that construction crew to make sure the baseball stadium gets done for February. I mean, that's where it starts first and foremost there. I, I think if you're Danny White. Um, I mean, I think secondly, you, you have got to continue to be um, you've got to be proactive. You've got to have a, a feel for where things are going in the world of college football. What's the latest with NIL about conference expansion? I mean, there's a lot of big picture stuff that I think you have to have a handle on because there's going to be some, some real decisions, you know, made kind of down the stretch. I think the good thing is, you know, he, he's got his coaches are pretty secure. Um, I don't think Rick Barnes is going anywhere unless Rick Barnes decides he wants to retire, which I don't feel that's the case. I think Josh Heupel is really happy here. We'll see how things go with the Lady Vols and, and all that kind of stuff. But 
Um, you know, I, I think it's for, for Danny White, it's about continuing to, to raise money. Um, you want to build a lot of things. I think it's about, you know, raising money for that. And then where are you with your NIL approach? How does the NIL world change? Because as, and Austin and I have talked about this a lot. The NIL thing seems to be changing still daily. Um, it was hourly. Now it seems like it's more daily and, and weekly, but there's certainly new things month to month. So we're, what's the next wave with, with NIL? Does, does Danny White become even more, you know, they, they've obviously, he's promoted Spire. He said good things about Spire, but what's the next step in terms of incorporating donor dollars, donors from the university side into the Spire side? What, what does that look like? moving forward with, with the NIL world as there's no guardrails put in place right now. Let's go to Smyrna Vol 77. Question for you, Austin Price. Who else is on Tennessee's board for the 2024 class and the transfer portal? For, for this year, it's uh, Dominic McKinley, who will be down here, uh, or is down here, actually gets here tomorrow, um, for the uh, Under Armour game um, here in Orlando. And he'll officially visit Tennessee on January 20th. And then the transfer portals, we'll see what happens with Evan Stewart. We'll see what happens with A.J. Harris. We'll see what happens with anybody else that were to go into the portal between now and maybe next week. So, um, you know, kind of right now, that's where we're at. It's a small board. The high school board is basically one kid, and the transfer board's a couple of kids. And and we'll see if they even make it to campus. It's all so very fluid. That part of it, Hubs actually hit the nail on the head. It is minute by minute, um, you know, and it literally it changes. Like it does. The, it the, does. I, the notions, the ideas, the thought processes change daily. For all a, 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 AP, is this a situation from a transfer portal standpoint that it's best available, or do you think there's some priority positions that Tennessee still would covet that they would take over another spot? You, you get what I'm what I'm kind of swinging out there is there is it is it a defensive lineman is it a corner is it a safety is there more of a priority on anybody that you would you, you would see them in the transfer portal with or do you think it's kind of best available at this point i think tessie would love to add a defensive lineman if they could um, i think they'd love to add an offensive lineman if they could if anybody ever goes in the tessie likes and feels like they could they, they can get help out of and you would think that somebody's eventually got to go in right i mean like um and then you know after that i mean you know, lug to me, receiver's a luxury. Um, you know, I think if Tennessee could get some more help in the secondary, um, that would help. And so, you know, again, we'll kind of see where it goes. But, you know, a lot of it may change depending on how they play, how these young kids play in this bowl game. Like if these young yeah. owners go out there and they play well, I get it's Iowa, they don't throw it a whole lot. But if they don't make mistakes, like mental bus, knowing your assignment, stuff like that, stuff that the common fan doesn't see, the stuff that we don't – Really know because we don't know exactly what their assignment is on every play. Then maybe that changes where they don't. Yeah, we're good with the secondary. You know? Well, you could also you could also have some changes too with this second transfer deal. If some of those guys, if somebody went in there, like, yep. like you were talking about earlier, that could change some of that priority as well. That goes back to your point uh, and the point we were making, Eric. Is it's just really really fluid. I mean, by by the day, by the hour, um, it, it just it seems to be always evolving. Yeah, and on a sidebar. Kind of going off with what you were just saying a moment ago, Austin. Um, Like, you know, Iowa's players offensively, they're on scholarship too. You got to go out there and play. But, I mean, what a a game to break in a Ricky Gibson, a Christian Conyer, a Jordan Matthews. I mean, a a John Slaughter. I mean, what a game to break those guys in for extended playing time, right? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, Iowa normally has some pretty good tight ends. So, you know, when, when, you know, their best they, ones hurt, but yeah, yeah, correct. But I mean, even their younger guys are still going to have, you know, they, they they work them a certain way. There's a reason that they keep throwing them in the NFL and they keep having success. And so, um, you know, I, I think that could be a matchup problem, you know, for a, for a linebacker or something. But for corners, you know, this is a good matchup. You don't need to just know where you're supposed to be. Don't bust. Cover the guy you're supposed to cover. They're not going to throw it a whole lot. Okay, Brent Hubs, let's go to Nashville Vol 615. Any update on Brew McCoy, both his recovery process and if he's returning or not? Well, yeah, Brew's in California. I don't think he's gonna I don't know that he's gonna make it to Orlando um, maybe at the end of the week, but I think he's trying to get as much rehab done as he can in California uh, with, with kind of his special his specialist out there. 
Uh, and then we'll see. I mean, if Brew's only decision um, and what he's deciding between Austin is the NFL and returning to Tennessee, then his window's different. Um, now, I mean, could he look at potentially transferring to another school? It doesn't feel like that's going to be the case. It, it feels to me like he's trying to decide whether or not he wants to come back or if he wants to try to take his chances with the NFL. And I think that depends on where he's at and where he thinks he's at in the rehab process now and kind of where he projects himself to be in the rehab process eight, ten weeks from now before you get into some real uh, NFL showcase type of stuff. Yeah, and, and he's you know working out with one of the best foot specialists, rehabbing with one of the best foot specialists in the country out in California. And so you know he is ahead of pace, uh, but is he ahead of pace enough to where he can kind of take that flyer and take his chance, you know, be there rehabbed enough to go through pro day? You know, I mean, I think that's something that I think that they're still trying to figure some things out and, and kind of and go from there. But uh, that's kind of where we're at with this thing. And uh, I would expect uh, Brew to make some type of announcement in the next seven to ten days. So we go from Nashville Vol 615 to Nashville 615. Austin, do you think Tennessee is keeping pace with other SEC rivals in recruiting? Do you think the last two classes are closing the gap with Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma, Texas, and LSU. And do you think it's fair to have expectations for Tennessee to make the 12 team playoff in 24 25 with Nico? Starting with that second one, also, I think absolutely. I mean, that means you're a top 12 team in the country. So for sure. But in terms of recruiting, do you think Tennessee's kind of closing that gap? Well, with the current guys in the conference, I mean, it's hard to say they're closing the gap when they've been behind them in the rankings, right? You know, I mean, are, are they closer now than they were when Josh Heupel got here? Yes. Are they where they need to be? Not quite. You know, I, I, again, I thought this class was good. It was not great. They missed on some guys. Now, you know, um, you know, for for various number of reasons, um, you got to find a way to, to to land those. Had they landed one or two more of those players? Now, if you just went off Tennessee star average and then what their you know their you know their you know, their average of their nineteen they signed, it's really good. You know, one of the best classes they've had in a long time around here. But, again, they missed on a few guys. And if you had those guys, you were sitting at 23 right now instead of 19. And you would land in a three or four more of those blue-chip guys, this class would be a top-five class or French top-five class, and they would feel drastically different, right? And so I think it's just about figuring out how to get over the hump in enough of those big-boy battles. They were winning some. They're winning more than – I think many people thought they would when Josh Heifel got here and he was, everybody was, you know, he can't recruit this and that, but are they, are they winning enough? And I think that that's where they've got to get over the hump and, and, you know, they've just got to continue to win football games. I think if Nico plays well Monday, plays well next year, I think that's like, whoa, whoa, you know, you know, where's Tennessee out with that 25 class, you know, is George, you know, George McIntyre's coming off the board in the next 30 to 40 days when he does, if it's Tennessee, how much of a shot in the arm off of that is, you know, okay, Nico just played the bowl game. He was fantastic. Tennessee just got a commitment from George McIntyre. Now you start to, you know, look around the state. You have some guys like, you know, Cam Sparks or Darius Jackson that have natural ties to George because they put on the same seven on 17. There's some built-in wins for Tennessee if they can land the right players, including George in that 25 class. So I guess for me, you know, um, they're not quite there yet. But again, they're better than where they were when they got here. And that says a lot about kind of the culture that's been built. Let's go to Vols by 50. With depth and overall talent, apparently better wide receiver going into next year. Do you anticipate coaches playing more than three primary receivers? Or Brent Hubbs is it more of a, I'll believe it when I see it type situation? Well, I mean, I, I think it just depends on how, how guys go. I mean, and who are your who are your options and where are they? I mean, where's the development of Nathan Laycock this offseason? Where's where's Chaz Nimrod and Caleb Webb moving forward? What about Dante Thornton, uh, assuming he's back? What does Dante look like um, a, a second year in the program? Uh, the other thing, too, is where are they with a tempo standpoint? I, I think this year they could have played more receivers – whenever they wanted to because they didn't play as fast because defense has had an opportunity to sub uh, multiple times. Do they get back to the tempo that we saw the first two years under Josh Heifel? If they do, then, you know, you're going to rotate during series and, and, or, you know, from one series to the next series, not within the series. And so, you know, how proven do those 
do those receivers how how much do they prove to Josh Heupel that they can handle whatever scenario that they are put in? Um, so to answer his question, I've got to see it before I say yes. They're definitely going to play more guys uh, because I you know I saw them shell some guys in year one. You know what I mean? They just said, hey, we're going to play three. We're going to play the only three we trust, and that's how we're going to play football. And you know th- this year they had to do it differently because of some injuries. So we'll see what they look like next year. And then in the Pittsburgh game in 2022, they literally threw it to one guy like 25 times because that's the only one they trusted. So, <laughs> but, but but hey, but hey, if they can't cover that, you know, it's it's the old, um, you know, it's the, remember the Titans like Novocaine, right? You keep doing it over and over. I mean, if they're not going to cover it, then yeah. you take you take what they give you sometimes. And um, you know, I, I think that um, I, I'm just curious to see the evolution of this offense. And this is not a knock on Joe, but I'm curious to see the evolution of this offense after this past year. What does Josh Heupel and his staff, Joey Halsley, learn from how defenses defended them? And how can they play? Uh, how do they play differently with Nico as their quarterback versus Joe as the quarterback? Hey, leave no doubt, Herman. Leave no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question. It goes to Nash of All 94. Awesome Nashville price. Nashville represented seven? in this thing, man. We got Nashville all represented everywhere. All over the place. Um, what steps would you take to get the transfer portal under control if you're the president of the NCAA? This is getting out of hand, in my opinion. Well, they let it get out of hand. You know, the NCAA let it get out of hand when they had no plan for NIL. Nope. Oh, it won't be that bad. It won't be that bad. Oh, God, what happened? You know, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I mean, they let it get this way. Now they're watching the world burn. And, and, and so, like, it is what it is. Like, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's bad for college football. It's bad for college sports in general. Like, you know, not that players should be able to go and, you know, go and transfer if they're not happy. They should. I'm all for transfer once. Transfer as many times as you want. And let's just change the name from College Forge to the JT Daniels. Right. I mean, like, this is just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's becoming, it's becoming, I think it's it's for fans who put a lot of time, effort, money into cheering for their school. It's easy for me to say, man, you just, just got to be a fan of the orange. You just got to be a fan of Tennessee. Just the the, the, the the tea, you know, ball walk. That's hard, man. I mean, kids, you, you become a fan of players, right? Like you become a fan of Peyton Manning. You become a fan of Eric Berry. You become a fan of, you know, Jawan Jennings. Like if Jawan Jennings and Eric Berry and Peyton Manning had all played at had played three different schools in four years, what would you feel about them? And I'm not saying you can't have a guy like Brew McCoy go from one school to the next. And and Tennessee fans love Brew McCoy, right? But like you look at, you know, somebody that can go two or three different places. I just think that's just it's where you're gonna lose the fans. Baseball lost the fans with the strike, and it took them a long time to get them back. If they don't watch out, you're going to lose your fans. And when college football loses what really drives the train, then it doesn't matter about ESPN or Fox or CBS or any of that stuff because eventually it slowly creeps into death. Well, and I think that the reality, and everybody wants a rule in place, right? I mean, we love you know love the rule that you only transfer transfer once or you can't transfer until after your sophomore season, right? you got to stay two years somewhere. Every time you do that, somebody's going to file a waiver, right? Somebody's going to somebody's going to fight it, and, and they're going to have some reasoning for fighting. And, and we all know the NCAA doesn't want to go to court, so the last thing they want to do is get sued. And, and so the NCAA is is because they've lost court battle after court battle after court battle. It's just kind of thrown their hands up and said, "Hey, whatever." I mean, if you want to fix it, then you need to get. You need to get a true figurehead in charge of college football, which is going to be impossible to find. Uh, and then I think the other thing, Eric, too, when you look at this is what's the natural guardrails that develop, right? I mean, can you continue to spin at an out of, at, a, at a high, high rate for, for NIL? Or do we get to the point where some guys, some big name guys really don't get what they think they're going to get out there? Do we get to the point where coaches get told, no, we don't have the money. We're not doing that. That's not a possibility. Because I'm going to tell you something. Those guys never get told no on anything. College football so, coaches, 
college football coaches need a wife because my wife tells me no all the time. I'm sure you guys do. I mean, yeah. like, you know, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, there's really, I mean, it, you know, everybody's afraid to make somebody mad. So you need something in the pinch. We're going to get it. Hey, I, I need a PJ in 30 minutes to go somewhere. Okay. We'll, we'll call a donor and we'll get, we'll get it for you. Right. When, I mean, they just don't get told no. And, and I think for NIL to ever have any kind of control and guardrails, I don't know that you can put rules in place because of legalities. The natural guardrails are going to be, you know, that's just not realistic. We, we just financially can't do that. Th this money is is just way, it is way too much. I mean, it, it's there, there's there's just it's just going to be really hard, I, and and we'll see how it develops over the course of the next couple of years. I do think there is some natural guardrails that will have to come into place and will come into place because right now it does feel like it's out of control. Never a dull moment in college football. Never a dull moment over at VolQuest.com. We got the latest, the Tennessee preparations for Iowa and the Citrus Bowl. Nico Imaliava, now your starting quarterback. Joe Milton opting out. What's the rest of this team look like? Uh, full coverage from Tennessee down in Orlando this week ahead of the Citrus Bowl. That is at VolQuest.com. Big thanks, as always, to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions. If you need roofing, siding, windows, or garage, contact Exterior Home Solutions today. They've been local. They've been trusted since 19. 99 that phone number is 865-524-5888 or you can visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com for brent hubs awesome price i am eric kane appreciate the questions as always and for you guys tuning in to us here on the vol quest mailbag podcast